Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today at the 2023 Bowder Lecture. The Bowder Lecture at Howard Community College is made possible by a generous grant from Dr. Lillian Bowder, Columbia resident, community leader, and a very gracious individual. We are also grateful that she has made today possible and ensures our students, our employees, and our Howard County community are exposed to wonderful authors. Howard Community College presents an annual endowed lecture known as the Bowder Lecture, and the chosen book will be celebrated with two student awards. Known as the Don Bowder Awards, any Howard Community College student who has read the featured book is eligible to respond and reflect on that book in an essay or other creative format. The awards honor the memory of Don Bowder, late husband of Dr. Bowder, and a champion of civil rights and social justice causes. The Bowder Lecture is a collaborative effort. Thank you to the Book Connection Committee, a partnership between the college and Hoko Polizzo, and to the Howard County Public Library for being a partner for the evening lecture, which will be tonight at 6 p.m. in HCC's Montebar Recital Hall. At the college, I'd like to thank the Office of Student Life, the Office of Development, the Office of Public Relations and Marketing, as well as the HCC Library and the English and Humanities faculty. It really takes everyone to make this wonderful event happen. There are three parts to the Bowder Lecture. A keynote by author Nadia Owusu, she will be joining us shortly, followed by a dialogue with author Tope Falaren, and it will end with a question and answer, answer period, so you are welcome to ask your own questions, whether you are in person here today or online joining us on Vimeo. So now, without further ado, I am pleased to introduce Tope Falaren, a Nigerian-American writer based in Washington, D.C. He serves as director of the Institute for Policy Studies and the Lannan Visit uh, Lecturer at Creative Writing at Georgetown University. Tope is the recipient of the Kane Prize for African Writing and Whiting Award for Fiction, and a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, among other awards. He was educated at Morehouse College and the University of Oxford, where he earned two master's degrees as a Rhodes Scholar. His debut novel, A Particular Kind of Black Man, was published by Simon & Schuster. Please welcome Tope Falaren. Such a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited about this event. Um, Nadi is a fantastic writer and speaker, and I'm so pleased that you'll have an opportunity to hear from her shortly. Um, I first heard about Nadia Wusu from my editor, Ira Silverberg. We were having lunch across the street from the Simon & Schuster office in New York City, and we just finished discussing my novel and what he expected from my next round of edits. I asked him what else he was working on, he told me that he had recently acquired a new memoir from a Ghanaian, Armenian, American writer, and he was really excited about it. She's the real deal, he said. She is incredibly talented. I asked him for more details, and he didn't say much. So I jumped on a train back to DC and threw myself back into my work and life when, a few months later, I learned that the writer Ara had told me about, Nadia Wusu, had won a Whiting Award for her book, a book that had yet to be published. I was intrigued and frankly a little shocked. How had this book managed to win one of the most prestigious awards that can be given to emerging writers when it wasn't even in print? I imagined a secret cabal of, <laughs> of editors and other influentials poring over Nadia's manuscript and deciding that her book was so incredible that it was worthy even though it wasn't available for purchase. I finally had the chance to read the book about two years later. I got my hands on a galley copy and read it cover to cover over the course of a couple days. Everyone was right. It was great. I was so taken with its ambition and how it managed to entwine exquisitely intimate moments with grand arguments about the long and fraught relationship between Africa and the rest of the world. It was simultaneously a study of Nadia's own life and how her life and many lives were shaped by geopolitical forces over which so few of us have control. It was emotional and fiercely intelligent. It was contemporary, and it drew on a long tradition of literature from the global north and south. 
In a word, it was essential. Nadi was born in Tanzania to a Ghanaian father and Armenian-American mother. Her family traveled frequently during her childhood from England to Italy, Ethiopia, and Uganda until Nadia moved to New York City when she was 18. Her memoir beautifully reflects these journeys and how they shaped her, and, how her, and her book also confronts the question of how Nadia, over the course of many anxious nights and days, began to shape an identity for herself. In this sense, her memoir serves as a guidebook for all of us as we attempt to fashion whole selves from the increasingly disparate components of our lives. This is one among many reasons why Nadia's book is so powerful. By so transparently and boldly leading us through the various stages of her life, she is showing us how we might survive, how we might thrive, how we might live. As I read Nadia's book, I kept thinking about a few other books I'd recently read and loved, among them What We, what we Lose by Zinzi Clemens, Freshwater by Kweke Emezi, Ghana Must Go by Taye Selassie. These are books that inspired me as I wrote my own novel because they are novels about humans who are engaged in the trying but essential work of defining themselves apart from the troublesome and noxious beliefs that have been manufactured by people who have little regard for us. Aftershocks is a part of that pantheon and will undoubtedly inspire many writers in the years to come. Nadia Owosu, who's based in Brooklyn at Aftershocks, was selected as the best book of 2021 by over a dozen publications including Time, Vogue, Esquire, and the BBC. It has been translated into five languages. It was a New York Times editor's choice pick and named one of Barack Obama's favorite books of the year. Nadia is the winner of a Whiting Award in nonfiction as, and has received fellowships from Yato and Art Omi. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, and The Wall Street Journal, among many other places. She teaches creative writing at Columbia University and at the Mountain View MFA program, and is a director of storytelling at Frontline Solutions, a consulting firm supporting social change organizations. Welcome, Nadia. Hello, everyone. Tope, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. Um, it was really moving, um, and I'm also such a fan of your work, and I feel like our work is in conversation. Um, so it's wonderful to be actually in conversation with you um, later today. Um, but before we get there, um, I, I'm going to talk about stories, telling them, revising them, claiming or reclaiming them, I don't mean stories just in the sense of my occupation as a writer of journalism, fiction, and nonfiction. I also mean the stories that are in the air we breathe and in the groundwater that become part of who we are. The stories that shape our lives, that shape how we see and treat ourselves and others, that are baked into local, national, and global policy, that are expressed as opinions and values. But first, let me tell you a story about myself. My mother left when I was two. My sister and I were raised by our father, who was the great hero of my life. He worked for a UN agency, so we moved to a different country every couple of years. And when I was seven and we were living in Rome, after a long absence, my mother showed up at our house on the same day that I learned about a catastrophic earthquake that destroyed the city of Spitak in Armenia. My father always listened to the BBC World Service in the morning, and I remember the voice on the radio talking about the possibility of aftershocks. And I remember asking my father what aftershocks are. He said, they are tremors that follow an earthquake, the Earth's delayed reaction to stress. Later that day, my mother took my sister and me to lunch. We walked around Piazza Navona. Then that evening, she dropped us back at our house and was gone again. Perhaps because my mother is Armenian-American, perhaps because my father generally avoided the topic of my mother and I felt like I wasn't supposed to talk about her, the earthquake and my personal shaking at having my mother show up and leave so quickly combined and conflated inside me. And I became obsessed with earthquakes and specifically the ways we predict and measure disaster. This obsession fermented as I got older and lived through other disasters, both private and seismic, a civil war in Ethiopia, 
my father's death when I was 13 and my mother still not coming for me, an act of terrorism in Uganda, a shaky relationship with my stepmother with whom I lived after my father died, being at the World Trade Center on 9-11 after I'd moved to New York for college, panic attacks and depression. And I began to think of my own life as existing on fault lines. I was a global citizen and a person without a clear home. I have a U.S. passport. My father was Ghanaian. My mother is Armenian from Watertown, Massachusetts. And my stepmother is Tanzanian. But I am often an outsider in those cultures or a person straddling the border. I struggle to find steady ground, even in my own sense of self. And at times, I was tormented by signals in my body, like those of a seismometer, warning me that another disaster was coming. And when I was in my 20s, my stepmother came to visit me in New York. We had a fight, and she revealed what is either a secret or a lie about my father. And she caused me to question my relationship with him, one of the few things in my life that was constant and steady. What followed was a real reckoning. I retreated for a week to a blue rocking chair in my bedroom. I needed to retreat from my life, to grieve in a way I'd never allowed myself, and to imagine and write myself a story I could live in because a lot of the stories I had been given about my history, African history, Ghanaian history, the reductionist black history I was often taught in school, and the seldom acknowledged history of the Armenian genocide that brought my ancestors to America were uninhabitable for me. I wanted to narrate myself to deeper understanding of the beautiful and rich histories and cultures of the places my family came from and all the places I briefly called home and the forces and private choices that shaped my life. The book started as a private project, a way to overcome the aches of isolation, dislocation, and disconnection. I began from a place of grief, but I found I was really writing toward love and connection even eventually toward reconciliation with my mother. I discovered how actively people in my life had worked to love me and how actively I held on to love for them across oceans and continents and estrangements. We can persevere in loving each other, even when, and maybe especially when, distance or other forces make it difficult. That's the biggest message I took away from the experience of writing the book, and it is one that continues to guide me in my work and my life. I wrote to make sense of the world and to learn about my own histories, and I discovered that many of the stories we have been given about our bodies, ourselves, our homes, and our places in them don't serve us. Some of those stories are untrue or not the whole truth. Some were actually created to do us harm. I needed to interrogate, complicate, and challenge harmful dominant narratives. How, I asked myself, can we reclaim and remake our stories toward healing and a more loving world? Certainly these questions are relevant to all of us as we live through book banning, the erasure of black history in public schools, the insistence on lies about, for example, there being two sides to slavery. The lie that slavery in America was anything other than a brutally exploitative economic and labor system which for 250 years relegated black human beings to property. These lies are dangerous. Not only do they minimize the racist violence of the past, but they also prevent us from learning about the revolutionary courage and vision that abolished it and the radical vision for freedom and justice put forth and continuously advanced by black Americans to this day. I believe that it is only through that kind of courage and vision that we can claim a better future. These questions are also relevant to Armenians across the diaspora. Only in 2021 did a United States president, President Biden, officially recognize the Armenian genocide. The systematic diminishment and mistreat mistreatment of that history is an act of violent erasure bringing to mind for me the words of Mojave poet Natalie Diaz, who writes in her brilliant collection, Post-Colonial Love Poem, I am begging, let me be lonely, but not invisible. I'm not Native American, but as a Ghanaian and Armenian American woman, I recognize myself in her words. I know a great deal about invisibility. And these questions are relevant to Ghanaians and Africans across the continent and beyond. 
I think often about a series of lectures delivered by the novelist Chinua Achebe in 1998 at Harvard, in which he rejected a thesis put forth by V.S. Nepal that European and white American civilization had absorbed enough of the rest of the world that they should be accepted as universal. Achebe argued that attempting to imitate or improve upon the literature of empire was to be accomplice in one's own dispossession. Instead, writers must believe in, honor, and insist upon the validity and value of their own stories, traditions, and values. These ideas will be familiar to many as some of the central arguments of post-colonial theory, which examines how writers from colonized and oppressed countries and communities have worked to articulate and celebrate our cultural identities and reclaim them from the colonial and oppressive powers. The theory also examines ways in which the literature of the colonial powers is used to justify colonialism through the perpetuation of images of the colonized as inferior. In his first lecture, Achebe describes encountering Joyce Carey's novel, Mr. Johnson, while a student at the University College at Ibadan in Nigeria in the early 1950s. The novel was ostensibly set in Nigeria, but Achebe and his, and his fellow students could see nothing of their homeland or themselves in it. Poverty and ignorance, Carey writes, of a rural town in Nigeria, the absolute government of jealous savages, conservatives as only the savage can be, kept it at the first frontier of civilization. Achebe goes on to quote excerpts from the work of Joseph Conrad and Elspeth Huxley about Africa and Africans, arguing that their stories advanced and supported colonial violence and enslavement of black people. Let us imagine, Achebe says, that someone has come along to take my land from me. We would not expect him to say he is doing it because of his greed. Such a confession would brand him as a scoundrel and a bully. So he hires a storyteller with a lot of imagination to make up a more appropriate story, which might say, for example, that the land in question could not be mine because I have shown no aptitude to cultivate it properly for maximum productivity and profitability. Indeed, Achebe declares, the heavy task of dispossessing others calls for such a story. He takes this further, noting a literary survey that found that there was a shift in the 18th century in European literature set in Africa in order not just to document the slave trade, but to defend it, moving from a previous literature focused on what so-called explorers saw along the way to a literature that intentionally dehumanized Africans as intellectually inferior, as savages, without meaningful culture or institutions. The content, style, and timing of this literature, Achebe says, leave us no doubt that its production was largely an ancillary service to the slave trade, as a salve for the conscience. And the literature that followed built upon that project. The Palestinian writer and a founder of the field of post-colonial studies, Edward Said, wrote much the same about the Orientalist storytelling project. Arabs, he wrote in his book, Orientalism, are thought of in the white world as camel-riding, terroristic, hook-nosed lechers whose undeserved wealth is an affront to real civilization. Always there looks the assumption that although the Western consumer belongs to a numerical minority, he is entitled either to own or to expend, or both, the majority of the world's resources. Why? Because he, unlike the Oriental, is a true human being. And in American Western films, cowboys with badges police a lawless, uncivilized land, maintaining the violent myths that obscure and promote a history of genocide, racism, imperialism, toxic masculinity, and the ongoing settler colonial project of America. What Mr. Johnson did for me, Achebe says, was to call into question my childhood assumption of the innocence of stories. It began to dawn on me, he wrote, that although fiction was undoubtedly fictitious, it could also be true or false. And he went on, it opened my eyes to the fact that my home was under attack, and that my home was not merely a house or a town, but more importantly, an awakening story in whose ambiance my own existence had first begun to assemble its fragments into coherence and meaning, about which I can say one thing, that it is not the same story Joyce Carey intended me to have. 
In other words, that encounter of that false story about Nigeria was among the seeds of why Achebe became a writer. I can recall a moment in my life that was similar to Achebe's encounter with Mr. Johnson. I remember that I was maybe 10. I came home with a world history textbook in which there were almost no stories about Africa. There was one chapter about ancient Egypt uh, illustrated with images of ancient Egyptians who all looked European. There was also a brief discussion of colonialism, but nothing of pre-colonial Africa. That erasure continued for much of my education, even when I was attending school in African countries. In fact, Achebe's Things Fall Apart was the only book by an African assigned to me in school until I got to university. What is the effect of all this erasure and distortion? What is my role as a writer in response to it? What does it mean to be Ghanaian, Armenian, American, and black? For me, it has often meant seeing myself through the eyes of others. Sometimes I am met with curiosity and interest, sometimes with confusion or even suspicion. I have been interrogated by my own communities about my identity and my rights to claim membership among them. Do you speak the language? What do you know of your own history? Do you know how to make jollof rice? Do you know how to make dalma? I'm often asked what it's like to be made up of such divergent cultures on opposite ends of the world. But the reality is that there is so much that is shared between the cultures and histories that make up my DNA. Armenians, Ghanaians, and black people are linked through their struggles against oppressive, violent, and genocidal forces, against dehumanization and denialism. In my memoir, Aftershocks, which is also a work of cultural history, I weave together stories of the enslavement of Africans and the ongoing humiliations and violence black people experience in America, the colonization of Ghana by the British Empire, and the ongoing post-colonial project that interferes in and seeks to destroy indigenous knowledge and to extract our resources, and the mass murder and displacement of Armenians in what was then the Ottoman Empire, which forced my great-grandparents to flee their homes in Marash and to seek refuge in the United States, and about the ways in which Armenians' right to self-determination and homeland continue to be threatened. These stories are linked by the fact of my body. I am made of these stories, but as I researched aftershocks, I also discovered so many other resonances. William Soroyan wrote of Armenians, I should like to see any power of the world destroy this race, this small tribe of unimportant people whose wars have all been fought and lost, whose structures have crumbled, literature is unread, music is unheard, and prayers are no more answered. Go ahead, destroy Armenia, see if you can do it. Send them into the desert without bread or water. Burn their homes and churches, then see if they will not laugh, sing, and pray again. For when two of them meet anywhere in the world, see if they will not create a new Armenia. With these words, he could also have been speaking of black people. The ancient drum rhythms of my father's tribe, the Ashanti tribe of Ghana, are very much discernible in jazz, a music invented in America by the descendants of enslaved people. Those rhythms miraculously survived the Middle Passage and took a new form in this country. The peoples I come from are joined by struggle, but also by hope, by an insistence on joy. That too, on all sides, is my inheritance. I've been thinking a lot about that inheritance over the last few years as we have faced a global pandemic, wars in places like Ukraine and Ethiopia, renewed violence against Armenians in the disputed territory of Nagorno-Karabakh, more black lives stolen by police violence, and the acceleration of climate catastrophe. Across the world, there has been so much suffering, so many reasons to be angry, so many reasons to grieve. What stories will we tell about this time in history? What will we learn? Some chose denial and division. They downplayed the seriousness of the pandemic and blamed the sick. In response to the largest movements for racial justice in the United States, many politicians began to say the quiet part out loud to villainize those who are fighting for justice. But there are reasons to believe that many others are choosing differently, are choosing love and solidarity, are creating a different future through the choices that, are making, that they are making today in their own lives. We have all taken in toxic stories from the air and the groundwater. Those stories might lead us to approach people we see as different from us with suspicion. They might lead us to be less open, less inclusive, and less kind. Stories are powerful. 
We cannot undo in the world what we won't undo in ourselves. And that must begin with holding up the stories we've been given to the light and asking ourselves, what is missing? Who is erased by them? Who is harmed? I think that is what writers can do. As for me, a story that I used to believe was that I was a person without roots, that that story grew out of the way I was often seen and rejected by others. But there is another story I can tell. It is the story I can believe in on a day like today, speaking with all of you. That story is that I am a person with strong, wide roots and wide branches. I have come to define home and community really expansively. I claim all the places and people I have lived among and loved and tried to belong to. My love for them makes them mine. It has taken me a long time to get here, but it's a beautiful place to be, and I wish it for everyone. And more than wishing, I'm committed to taking action to make that possible on the page and off. I'm asking myself what stories I want to tell and believe in. I'm interested in the conversation now happening about revisionist history that is not about erasure, but about inclusion, about locating deeper truths. I'm interested in troubling the stories about people like me, borderland people. In the media and literature, we're often depicted as either evidence that the pendulum is swinging toward justice or as doomed figures who'll never find belonging. The stories I want to tell are more complicated. How do borderland people both enact and subvert historical and political conflicts in our most intimate relationships? How can we claim our own identity and subjectivity? What happens when we refuse to accept the oppressive interpretations of history we've been given? When we refuse to accept the systems that grew out of those interpretations? When we demand new ones? These are some of my urgent questions, which I think I'll be poking and prodding at for the rest of my life. To quote the abolitionist organizer Ruth Wilson Gilmore, what the world will become already exists in fragments and pieces, experiments and possibilities. And I think that's so much what writing is about, a commitment to a process and the constant interrogation of the self and of the world toward remaking it. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to be here with this community and so moving to know that um, there has been this kind of engagement with my work. It means so much um, to be invited to be here. Um, so thank you to everyone who has organized this event and to all of you for coming. And um, just uh, to give you a little taste of the prose, I'm going to read a very, very short uh, excerpt from Aftershocks. Um, and it's called Failures of Language. I do not have my great-grandfather's worn but carefully pressed cotton handkerchief. My father's family aren't much for holding on to material things. I do not have my maternal great-grandmother's red hair or my paternal grandfather's coffee bean skin. What an unusual combination, people often say when I describe my parentage, Ghanaian, Armenian, and more than once, how did that even happen? I speak three and a half languages that do not belong to me, that do not run through my veins. English, Italian, and French, decent Swahili. When my relatives and country people maneuver between English and their home languages, tree, Armenian, and Turkish, I grip the ropes of the English words as firmly as my jittery hands will allow and loop them into knots. I watch for cocked eyebrows and pursed lips to translate the rest. The warm, round percussion of tree and the orderly harmony of Turkish, which spoken by my family, is diluted with a splash of archaic Armenian and a heavy pour of Boston accent, are familiar but impenetrable. I can spot members of my two disparate tribes in a crowd, but I cannot address them except in basic greeting and pleasantry. Good morning. How are you? Welcome. In tree, I can also say, even the elephant can swap flies with its short tail, and any river loses its identity when entering the sea. My father, when his intention was to remind or chastise, was fond of proverbs and folk tales. The heroes of those tales were animals of the forest, spirits, and gods. I know them by name. My Ghanaian relatives are at times tickled by my inability to speak tree. At other times, they are affronted. How can you not speak your own language, they ask, not acknowledging that my learning it would have required them to teach me. 
Once when I was in the market with an auntie, I cannot remember which one, a woman asked why no one had taught me to speak my father tongue. Nobody wants to hear her speaking tree in an American accent, the auntie replied. Since she replied in English, I can only assume she meant for me to understand. In tree, I cannot say, love me, accept me, I need you, please don't die. In Turkish, I know the words for eggplant, yogurt, and savory pastries. The stories of my mother's family are very much concerned with food, what was served, whose dish was tastiest, and delicious gossip, who messed up the baklava. As a child, when I visited them in Massachusetts, we talked about eggplant, lash kebab, and pilaf with little chopped up noodles in it. We planned for dinner as we washed lunch dishes. We ate to remember those who escaped genocide and nearly starved in the desert to honor what they made possible for us. My grandmother taught me to roll rice and lamb into grape leaves. My mother read to me from 1001 Nights. Ali Baba said, open sesame and discovered a stolen treasure. A genie emerged from a lamp to do Aladdin's bidding. Scheherazade told tales to a king to delay her own execution. Another one, I said to my mother after each story, tell me another one. I do not know the Turkish word for stay. I cannot say, mama, come back. In Armenian, the language largely lost to my mother's family generations ago in the Ottoman Empire, the only word I know is the word for underwear, vardik. This knowledge I cannot explain. When I encounter strangers from my tribes, they are startled by my attempts to communicate. They do not recognize me as one of their own. They laugh, charmed, and perhaps a little disturbed by the discrepancy between appearance and sound. When I explain myself, they think me a curious hybrid. They speak to me always in English. Thank you. <laughs> Hello again. Can you hear me? Perfect. Is it on? It's on. Oh. <laughs> we're here. We're here. We're live. <laughs> that was a lovely lecture. Oh, thank you. Um, and it's wonderful, I think, to hear a writer. I've read your book a couple times now for various reasons, and it's wonderful to hear a writer talk about their work in their own words. Because I know it's such a mystical process to sit down and try to write, and um, and you get the words on the page, and you cry, and you yell, and you have arguments with people about what should be in the book and what should be shouldn't be in the book. <laughs> And then the book is out, and then somebody else says, oh, this is what the book is about. It's always a very strange process. Um, so good to hear about your process. As I was listening to your lecture, I couldn't help but wonder about how story operates in your life and your relationship to story. Um, how important is storytelling to your conception of self? Mm, that's such a great question. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, I, I think I started to realize... Um, uh, probably in my 20s that I, I felt so disconnected from the histories and stories of the places that I came from. And so stories began to take on this sort of really important uh, role in my life um, because I felt like I was living inside of stories that didn't make sense to me, that, me, that were doing harm, that were confusing, that I couldn't sort of connect like my sense of who I was to the stories I was told about who I was. And so then it became clear to me um, what an important role stories uh, play in shaping our lives. In, in many ways, our identities are stories, a country is a story, um, our histories are stories, and uh, who gets to tell the story is always sort of something that is contested and renegotiated. And so it felt really important for me once I began to sort of realize that and to realize that my sense of disconnection was actually a sense of disconnection from the stories um, that that felt really vital and important um, in order for me to claim my full sense of self. And so that's sort of when I kind of uh, sat down and started to engage in what I call this private project, which became ultimately Aftershocks. But it really did start as a private project of, of trying to create a new story for myself um, that I could kind of live inside of, because as I said, the ones I had been given felt uninhabitable. 
um, and I couldn't find my way into them. I couldn't locate myself in them. And so in some ways, the private project was a way of sort of studying um, the histories of the places that I came from and then sort of connecting my own life um, to those histories and sort of locating myself in those stories. Yeah, that's so powerful. And I, gosh, I mean, what you say uh, in so many ways is my story mm -hmm. as well. When I was growing up, I had this distinct sense that, um, and I couldn't have used these words to say it. It was, you know, it's, you're young and you're trying to figure out why it is you feel out of sorts all the time. And the way I would describe it now is that I felt like reality wasn't constructed for my benefit. Like, mm -hmm. I just had this sense that, you know, and I know it sounds, but that's, you know, again, seven-year-old Tope wouldn't say it that way. But, um, no, looking back, that's how I, I felt. Like, I just had the sense that I'm not, I mean, nothing about me fits in this world. Um, I don't feel fully human the way that some of my friends do. Um, I sort of loathe and despise parts of myself, even though my, my dad was constantly saying, uh, you are handsome, you are, you are, you know, all these things he would say in his, in his accent. Like, then it seemed to resonate with the way that I saw myself and the way other people um, mm -hmm. sort of described me. So I wonder as, I'm, I'm so interested in that transition for you, Nadia, between starting something as a kind of private project and then at some point deciding this is for public consumption. Mm -hmm. How did that happen for you? Yeah, thank you for sharing, um, sharing that uh, story from your life too because that really resonates with me. I think so much of reality as we experience it is a construction and that doesn't make it real but um, it's shaped by the stories we tell about who's deserving and who isn't, who is beautiful and who isn't and there are all, those values are sort of baked into the way that we come to know ourselves. Um, and so, and, and so, yeah, that, that story really resonates uh, with me. Um, but in terms of sort of moving from my conception of this private project that I was working on, really because I felt like I needed, it was the only way that I could see to kind of carry myself back out into the world with a new sense of who I was that felt honest and truthful and, um, and hopeful. Um, and so it was really a way, the private project was really a way for me to find that hope um, and to sort of understand my history um, in a useful way. Um, but I was at the same time writing a novel um, and I'd always wanted to be a writer. I didn't know any writers, um, so I didn't think of it as sort of a career path, but it was something that I've done since I was a child. I think maybe because of that sense of dislocation, similar to what you were describing, that I was always inventing stories, and I, and I liked to live inside the stories that I invented more than in the real world a lot of the time. Um, and so th I can't remember a time before I was engaged in a process of writing. I was a big reader. Um, I, I've, I've always loved to, to tell stories and to write stories. Um, but yeah, I, I, I didn't want to write a memoir for some reason. I think that's also connected to a story about what a memoir is. I didn't feel important. Um, and, I, and I always kind of uh, conceived of memoirs or, or autobiographies as something that famous people wrote. Um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't sort of like imagine why anybody else would be interested in this project. Um, and so I was writing a novel. And then also I thought of the novel as sort of that's what literature is. And what I was doing was not literature. Um, which I think is another harmful story that sort of um, that sort of divides the kinds of writing that people do and sort of creates this a false hierarchy of of literature in some ways. But I was working on a novel at the same time as I was working on this private project, and the novel was not working. I couldn't figure out how to make it work, and then it dawned on me that what I was trying to do in the novel, and I don't think this is true of novels in general, I think it just happened to be true of the novel that I was working on because I was lying <laughs> about my life in the novel um, and I was telling sort of a, a different story, a, a story that felt more um, literary in some sense and then in the private project, I was telling the truth about my life and working on those two projects at the same time, the novel was just doomed to fail in that sense. Um, because as Achebe said, like fiction can be, uh, is, is always fictitious, but it can also be true or false. And in, the, in that case, the, the novel was false. Um, and so then I realized, you know, um, I needed to find some courage uh, in the private project that I was working on. And that if 
this process was actually helping me to find my way out of this sense of dislocation that maybe it would be helpful to other people. And I knew that there were other people who were experiencing sort of the same questions and grappling with the same things. And so, um, so then I set the novel aside and I started kind of looking at the private project as something that maybe would be useful in the world. Yeah, that's uh, so many potential questions from that <laughs> response. Uh, but one that strikes me now, I, I have a strong suspicion that there are some people here who have their own stories that they like to sort of mm -hmm. broadcast to the world. Um, you mentioned that you didn't have any connection to anybody in the writing world, that mm -hmm. you were in effect starting this by yourself. Can you talk a little bit about the courage of like sort of starting a project and then beginning to place it out for you know public consumption and and trying to navigate what can be a, like a very difficult sort of publishing universe that isn't necessarily wasn't created to sort of platform stories mm -hmm. like yours yeah yeah that's a great question i think you know i was working on the private project that became aftershocks for a decade um and so I think all of that time that I spent sort of working on it just for myself was a gift in so many ways because I was doing it without a sense of ambition or I wasn't trying to be any particular kind of way beyond sort of being as honest as possible because the book sort of served the purpose of kind of um, helping me to find my way into the world again um, after a period of deep depression. And so... Um, I think that that was a gift that I wasn't looking at it as a book um, because I didn't have all of these external expectations um, kind of hanging over it. Um, I wasn't wondering about the market per se. You know, I was sort of doing that in, when I, in the novel project, but I wasn't doing that with the memoir. And I think that that actually was really useful. Um, but then, you know, I was, I was about to turn 30 and I, and I realized that the one thing that I would really regret if I didn't give it a chance was trying to, you know, fulfill this lifelong dream of being a writer. Um, and so then I, I sort of said, okay, well, it's possible that I'll fail, um, but what if I just try? Um, and so I started making my way out really slowly, sort of submitting small sections from the, the, what became the book uh, for publication in literary journals. And I didn't really know anything about the, the, you know, the literary world, uh, which I think kind of gave me a little bit of hubris you know, to submit to bigger journals than maybe someone at my level might have otherwise. Um, and so, yeah, it was a very slow process over the, a period of a few years kind of just um, sending you know some of the excerpts out and then some of them started to get published and by that point I was thinking about it as a book um, and then I think I was really fortunate in many ways you you uh, talked about our our uh, shared editor Ira um, uh, who worked on both of our books and uh, and I don't think it's a coincidence that our books are in conversation, actually. I think that Ira had this commitment to sort of getting stories out into the world that might not otherwise have found a home in the, liter in the literary space. And so I, I, felt, I feel very fortunate that, uh, that Ira became my editor at that point. Yeah. Ira's marvelous, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he is the reason I'm sitting here having this conversation with you. So I'm very, very grateful to him. Um, do we want to reserve like 10 minutes for yes. audience? I think we're yeah? um, okay. ready to open it Sounds up to good. questions. Yep. If you're in the theater, please feel free to step down to the microphones here. Um, and um, online, of course, it, the Q&A is now open. Okay. Yeah. If you don't mind. Thank you for being first. I, was, I wasn't going to be, but I didn't want to lose this opportunity to ask a question. Um, so I have a background in journalism from high school. Um, I was a creative writer and I've always wanted to write. I am now in the health science department in the dental hygiene <laughs> area because I wanted to um, go into a field that made money um, mm -hmm. for a long time. So I had to do that to support family. But um, my question to you is, and I didn't want to lose this opportunity because I have two college age daughters that are kind of finding themselves. Um, when you began this journey of trying to write 
about your life and you were saying that you may not have been, um, I don't know, worthy of memoirs or whatever um, people feel that they're not worthy of. Um, what was your steps in going, okay, now I'm going to do this and, and where did it go from thinking to a reality about becoming a writer, a creative writer especially, because we have this in our, our family. I mean, I'm actually writing children's books right now as I'm doing dental hygiene things just for fun, but you never know. Sometimes people want to say, you know, can this be a, a, you know, something that I can do in reality? So wh what was the step from think, thinking about it to making it a reality for you? Because you're so successful and amazing. So I'm just wondering where that transition occurred. Yeah, thank you so much. That's so, such a great question. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's such, that's such a great question. Um, I think I think like one of the big transition points for me was um, I began to talk about the project for for a really long time. It was kind of a secret. I wasn't telling anyone about it. Um, and then I started to kind of talk about the project with a few friends, and they. Then, you know, as happened with Tope and I today, kind of started to share their own stories um, and sort of uh, how they could see resonances in my story, even though they were coming from really different places in, in, in many cases and uh, wildly different life experiences. But they began to sort of, as I started to talk about the project, they began to share those stories with me. And then I realized, you know, that there were people out there for whom my story would be useful, who maybe needed a story like that um, in the world and that sort of began to give me some courage and and so I think um, yeah just just uh, owning sort of the the sense of you know I'm working on this project whether or not it sees the light of day but even just hearing you talk today about I'm working on these children's books you know the courage to kind of say it out loud I think uh, was a big transition point for me just saying I am a writer whether or not I'm ever ever published this is something that I care about and that I spend a lot of my time doing and I think that owning that part of my identity was was sort of the big transition for me we do have a question online for you, Nadia. Um, can you talk a little bit about how difficult it is to write true stories about family, especially when those truths can be difficult? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's such an important question for people who are writing memoir or even uh, autobiographical fiction. Um, I thought about it a lot. You know, I, because I started the project um, not intending to publish it. It gave me a lot of freedom to just get the stories out on the page um, in, a, in the most honest way that I could. Um, and because I, the intention behind the project was really to set myself free from a lot of the sort of anger and resentment that I was holding on to in my life that didn't serve me. And so I sort of began to create these sort of um, like values for myself in terms of how I was approaching writing about other people on the page. It became really important to me that nobody should be a villain because nobody really is, or nobody in my life is all bad or all good. And so that was really important to me to not treat anybody as sort of a one dimensional person on the page. Um, and that, and then the other thing that I sort of was holding as I was writing was to always be writing toward connection and toward understanding. And even, that doesn't mean sort of smoothing over the difficult parts, but it did mean that I, that I had to push myself to, to extend compassion and generosity to the people in my life. Um, and I think that because I was holding on to those values, then when I decided that I was going to try and publish these pieces, um, I was able to then go back at, back to the pages and ask myself, okay, is anyone going to be harmed by these stories? And that was a really important question to ask myself. Um, and it actually pushed me into having conversations with people in my life. Um, and so I said, you know, in, in, in the lecture, that one of the things that this story actually did for me was it helped me to reconcile with my mother. Through writing about her, I came to empathize with her in ways that I hadn't previously. Um, and that sort of moved me to reach out to her after a decade of estrangement to sort of begin to have a dialogue. And so then we were in conversation for many years uh, before the book came out about the events that were going to be narrated in the book. And that also felt important to me that um, 
when writing about real people to be in dialogue with them and and so not to have sort of big surprises that were going to take people aback, you know, when they encountered the book. And so those were some of the ways that I thought about it. But it certainly is a challenge when you're writing about real people um, to kind of hold yourself accountable to uh, to not villainizing anyone and um, to telling the truth um, about yourself as well, and if you're going to tell the truth about other people, to hold yourself to those same standards too. Just taking a beat to see if anyone in the theater has a question. We do have another online question. True art is up to the interpretation of the consumer of it. Your work is seen as inspirational and an act of courage. What advice would you give to your younger self to guide her to walk through with courage and achieve her dreams? That's a lovely question. You know, I think that um, I, would, I would encourage my younger self to trust her instincts more. You know, uh, the, the, coming back to the story that uh, Tope was telling um, about himself as a child, um, I had very strong instincts that things that I w was being told were not true or not the whole truth or that something about reality, the way that it was constructed was not serving me. But, you know, because when you're younger, there are authority figures and you sort of believe them and you don't really question the stories that they're telling you. And, and so then you internalize those stories. And I think, but yet there was this sort of like this, this voice in the back of my head or a feeling in my gut that said, no, this actually is wrong. And that, that, um, that I should trust my instincts and try to find, you know, another way to look at the world and to look at my family and to understand uh, myself and my own identity. And so I think I would tell my younger self to trust those instincts and then to follow those instincts to deeper learning and understanding and to follow my own curiosities and questions. So, you, is this working? Okay. <laughs> so, you've spoken a lot about reconciliation today. Um, what I'm curious about is, there's a, to me, there's a distinction between reconciliation and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So, like, I guess, what do you think about that? I guess distinction. Yeah, I think there's definitely. That's a great question. I think there's definitely a distinction. Um, I think that. Uh, Reconciliation can often be sort of an invitation to be in relationship, but that doesn't mean that everything's fine. <laughs> um, and I think forgiveness is a process and a journey. You know, we often think of forgiveness um, in ways that I, I think can actually be quite harmful, which is, you know, sometimes we think of it as sort of a one and done thing. Like, I have forgiven, and so therefore the conversation is over. Um, and then oftentimes, too, I think forgiveness, the onus of forgiveness is put on the harmed person, whereas I actually think a dialogue, an ongoing dialogue, a lifetime commitment to continuing to wrestle with the difficult things, that that process is actually what forgiveness is, that it isn't sort of a one-off decision, um, that it's, it's continuing to be in relationship and to ask questions and to move through discomfort and challenge and tension um, together. So that's sort of the way that I, that I think about it. You're, you're tiny like me. Maybe I'll give you the mic and then. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm also an Armenian. And so uh, I've always like had a difficulty like connecting myself to like the stories um, of like my grandmother and how she survived the genocide. So um, I was just wondering like, how did you begin to like start connecting yourself to those stories and like how has it impacted your life, I guess? Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, so, you know, the story of the Armenian genocide was one that I was told as a child by my father, and my, my mother wasn't very much in my life, but my father wanted me to have some sense of that history, so I did know that the reason that I had an American passport was because my uh, family had escaped genocide and come to America as refugees, so I knew sort of the broad strokes of the story, but I wasn't deeply connected to the culture. Um, I, I didn't spend a lot of time with the Armenian side of my family, and so it was a history that I was very much disconnected from, and yet it has shaped my life in so many ways. I wouldn't exist, um, you know, were it not for that history in that my parents actually met in the United States because my father, um, my Ghanaian father, had come here uh, to go to university and uh, in Cambridge and met my, my mother, um, who was from a town close to Cambridge in Watertown, and so just, just in that sort of simple way, that's the history that sort of brought my parents together and shaped my world. But then I also, um, you know, as I began to work on the private project, realizing how disconnected I was from that story, and I feel very much Ghanaian. I was raised by the Ghanaian side of my family, and so although there are complications in terms of my connection and identity, and sort of, I moved around a lot, and so I didn't grow up in Ghana, but I, I did grow up with a strong connection to the Ghanaian side of my family and that side of my identity, but the Armenian side, not really. And so as I was um, sort of engaging in this private project, one of the questions that I had for myself is, how can I actually know myself when I don't have any sense of this history, you know, in a deep way? Um, and so I began to sort of read a lot about Armenian history, um, and I actually found this uh, collection of kind of oral, um, like, narratives um, of the Armenian genocide in which my, my uh, great uncle and my great aunt's stories were included. Um, and, and that was really moving to me because then I, I could kind of like, I had met my great aunt and so knowing her, I could feel that connection to that history in a way that I hadn't been able to before where it felt very abstract. Um, and, and so reading those stories was a big sort of uh, starting point. But then I, you know, once I, um, reached out to my mother and st started to reconcile with her, I also spent a lot of time with my grandparents and just asking them questions about their experiences and their lives. And one of the things that I found that was so interesting to me is um, the way in which sort of uh, surviving the genocide had impacted my great-grandmother's mental health and my grandmother's mental health and my mother's mental health and how, you know, that sort of intergenerational trauma was passed down and um, in some ways contributed to my mother leaving when I was two. And so all these years later, you know, the, the forces of, of, of that displacement um, had impacted my life in a really material way. And so tracing that history to my own life um, was both sort of uh, deeply sad in some ways, but also deeply moving to find myself reconnected uh, to those stories and also connecting to the, to the parts of those stories that were joyful and resilient and hopeful and the new lives that they created in this country as well. So that has been really important. You know, my grandparents love to dance and they love to eat. And so getting to know them as well um, has been, ha was a really meaningful part of that journey. We have our last question. My question, my question isn't as deep as the other ones. Um, <laughs> there, was a, there was a character in your memoir named Agatha. Um, I was just wondering, did things ever get better for her, or did it stay the same? Sorry, can you repeat that? I'm sorry, I wasn't able to hear you. Uh, the character in your memoir, Agatha, did things ever get better for her, or like, did it stay the same? Oh, Agatha. Yeah. Um, yes, we, we actually have reconnected. Um, you know, when I was younger, we didn't have um, social media. So once I left a place, I wasn't in touch with people. So Agatha, for those who have not read the book, um, she was a classmate of mine in, in boarding school. And, um, and, and the, the relationship that I had with her was very complicated because we were two 
uh, of maybe a handful of black students in this kind of posh uh, boarding school in England. Um, and we both experienced a lot of uh, racism um, in that school, but Agatha was uh, darker skinned than I was. And she, so she experienced sort of the brunt of it. And um, I distanced myself from her in a way that I became deeply ashamed of. Um, I did it, it was a survival mechanism. I did it in order to fit in. And yet it was really important to me to kind of hold myself accountable to the ways that I engaged in that colorism um, as a child and to ask questions about sort of where the, those values that are so harmful and that I had internalized came from. And so um, the story that I wrote in the book about Agatha sort of like connects to the history of col colorism um, and the history of, um, of the ways in which uh, colonialism and slavery have divided black communities. Um, and so I sort of tell the stories of, of that history, but then also sort of hold myself accountable for my actions as, as, a, ch as a young person um, in school. But we actually did reconnect um, over social media, and um, we ha we've had a really wonderful conversation about it, have laughed about sort of our shared experiences of boarding school, um, and, um, and gotten to know each other now um, outside of that environment. I think that concludes this portion of, the, of our, our wonderful Bowder Lecture Day. And we want to express our thanks to both of our distinguished writers for your wisdom and insights. Um, those here in person can speak with them in the lobby immediately following for book sales and signing. And Ms. Owusu is providing a creative writing workshop at 215 in the Rouse Company Foundation building on the fourth floor for anyone who would like to join. Um, and both writers will present to our community again tonight at 6 o'clock in Montebaro Hall. Um, and thanks again to Dr. Bowder, but especially um, our partners and all of you for attending. Thank you. Thank you.